Good afternoon, good evening for some of you, good morning for others. Uh, I'm Dr. Sita Pena Gangadaran, Associate Professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics and Political Science. I'm also the founder of the Justice Equity and Technology Project there and a co-lead and co-founder of Our Data Bodies. To get us started very quickly, I just wanna get a sense of who's tuning in to the live stream. And I'd like to ask you if you can please use your chat function to answer the following question. Um, plus is if you can remember and minus is if you cannot remember. And the question is, where were you on May 25th, 2020? A plus if you can remember and a minus if you can't remember. You should be able to see some of your answers in the chat. Again, the question is, can you remember where you were on May 25th, 2020? As you're remembering or misremembering or remembering that you don't remember, um, let me explain. Uh, May 25th, 2020 was the day that George Floyd was murdered. And in the wake of his murder, this prompted a uh, worldwide outcry over racial injustice, systemic violence, systemic racism, institutionalized racism against black people in particular and people of color in general. And it's within this context that this panel was conceived and what we're hoping is to marry some of the insights and teachings and learnings that have happened over the months since may 25th 2020 with a conversation and a frank conversation about data protection and privacy our moderator for today is dr seda gersis uh, who is currently an associate professor in the Department of Multi-Actor Systems at TU Delft. Um, and uh, she will introduce our fellow panelists and take you on this journey for this discussion. Thanks, Seda. Thank you, Sita, also for reminding us of that historical and tragic moment that also opened, on the one hand, um, an, a, an amazing a vision of possibility uh, as much as the middle of COVID-19. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm honored and delighted to be among the bright and sharp speakers of our panel and I would like to take a short moment to introduce them to you. Um, I'll introduce them in the order they'll be speaking. So I'll start with Sarah Chander uh, who is currently in the team at the Edry Brussels office uh, acting as a senior pol policy advisor working on AI and discrimination. In particular, she focuses on finding ways as to how Edry's work can be better connected to social and racial justice issues and movements. Previously, Sarah worked in advocacy at the European Network Against Racism, ENAR, on a wide range of topics, including anti-discrimination law and policy, hate crime and speech, racial profiling and diversity and inclusion. Before that, Sarah worked on youth employment policy for the UK Civil Service, and she was actively involved in movements against immigration detention. Dr. Nakima Steffelbauer is our sec uh, second speaker. She's the founder and CEO of the Frown Loop Org and the te Technicolor.eu network of racially diverse tech leaders in Europe. She holds MA and PhD degrees from Harvard Univers University and an MBA from the Quantic School of Business and Technology. And she has led digital transformation projects in e-learning, e-commerce, fintech, insurtech, and ERP for the public and private sectors. 
Dr. Steffelbauer writes and speaks about mitigating bias in artificial intelligence and venture capital, and has presented on AI impact at the European Parliament, as well as for various German research organizations. Yasmin, um, on the other hand, is a creative technologist and a researcher concerned with the social impacts of the relationship between humans and technology. She's currently a co-organizer for the initiative No Tech for Tyrants, a visiting fellow at the Ada Lovelace Institute and a researcher at the Institute for Technology in the Public Interest. Her artwork offers a conceptual insight into complex technologies and can be seen in the art gallery section of the CPDP conference. And last but not least, Nani Janssen Reventlo is the founding director of the Dig Digital Freedom Fund, which supports partners in Europe to advance digital rights through strategic lit litigation. She's a recognized international lawyer and expert in human rights litigation responsible for standard setting freedom of expression cases across several national and international jurisdictions. In addition, Nani is a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School an adjunct professor at Oxford University's Blavatnik School of Government. Okay, after giving you a quick account of these very impressive biographies, I would like to announce that this is a PowerPoint free panel. Um, this was not made by design, but nicely came to be. Uh, and with that, I'd like to pass the word to Sarah. Please, Sarah. Thank you very much, Seda. And thanks to everybody for inviting me to this panel. Steve really nicely framed um, my words and what I would like to speak about today. Specifically, how can the reflections and the issues that I think the entire world really came to know about since the murder of George Floyd, how can some of those issues be effectively incorporated in the world of data protection and privacy um, and what better place to have this conversation than at CPDP. Um, so I'll jump in. I really wanted to start my intervention by talking about looking specifically at some of the uh, core issues that racialized communities in Europe specifically are confronting today. So we are slowly as a community, as a society, becoming more aware of issues like racial profiling, brutality, uh, particularly uh, the murder of George Floyd might be the first time that many people have thought about police brutality and racialized police brutality specifically. Uh, Europe has its own George Floyds in many ways um, and I don't have the time to speak about the, the various uh, men and women from black and brown communities across Europe that have suffered uh, at the hands of the police and many of whom have unfortunately died at the hands of the police. Um, all of these issues and, and, and these lost lives fall into a broader context of criminalization and surveillance um, of racialized communities, racial profiling, as I said, but also some broader issues like overrepresentation in precarious work, um, the stream of issues that relate to the very real safety and social impacts of Europe's border regimes uh, and migration policies on, on various people, mostly black and brown people coming to Europe. As you probably have seen and in some of the panels that we are attending here at CPDP, all of these issues are increasingly impacted and exacerbated in general by processes of datification or the engagement in some way of big tech corporations in the public services that, uh, that govern migration control or policing. Um, amongst other things, therefore, increasingly we're seeing that these issues, racial profiling, are also issues of privacy and of data protection too. And it might be possible that these frameworks could offer us some solutions. Uh, first of all, I wanted to have a reflection of to what extent are they doing that. I think that increasingly we are seeing a few instances where data protection frameworks might be helping us in these regards. So the ongoing cases around uh, the algorithmic management of uh, platforms, working platforms like Uber and Deliveroo have been increasingly challenged by this. We're also seeing more and more conversations where data-driven policing practices, for example, um, are being challenged potentially, or at least considering to be challenged by data protection laws. 
I do think that there are these these uh, the, these frameworks and the concepts of privacy in general are going to present us some opportunities for some small wins. But what I what I want to challenge here today is whether these frameworks that we have and the movements that we have built around them, so the digital rights movement as as a whole, if they are fully equipped um, to challenge and address the racial full extent of the racial justice implications that they that they touch upon. For now, I would like to say they, they are not, but why not specifically? And I want to explore that here with you today, with the panelists and with the, for the rest of the people in the room and in the speaking in the in the in in this room today, who I can't see unfortunately. Um, how exactly are data protection and privacy frameworks limited to address racial justice issues? So yesterday I was listening into a panel, um, and a lawyer said that. Uh, the GDPR can solve around 90% of issues emanating from data protection and fundamental rights issues. When I was thinking through my lens of racial justice, the surveillance of black and brown people in Europe here today and the various other issues that come, that come into connection with data protection, I was thinking, is that true? I really am not sure and I think there are two main reasons why I'm not sure. Uh, the first is this critique of the individualist uh, foundations of the GDPR. So the GDP, GDPR requires us um, not only to have uh, to meet a burden of proof to prove that one of the, the rights and protections contained therein have been violated with respect to one specific individual, but also more broadly, and this was summarized really nicely by uh, Lynette Taylor in her most recent uh, in her most recent article, she said, that although data protection is usually cited as the key to controlling the power of big technology firms, its underlying premise, which is the rational, informed and liberal subject, is vulnerable with respect to the new paradigms of big data and AI. And I would say that this is a criticism that's true not just of the GDPR, but also of, our, of much of our digital rights work, which is for the most part centered on how we can just be better, more savvy users of technology, um, and therefore use our, our legal tools to challenge this. I think this assumption is fundamentally based on a norm of the white, middle-class, educated, cishet male who might have the resources and the knowledge to use their data protection rights um, to challenge, to challenge uh, some of these issues in many ways. But does, it, um, does the framework uh, meet the standards to be able to challenge the injustices that are experienced by people who do not meet that norm. The second shortcoming is that a lot of the foundations of the GDPR are based on this concept that we should hold data processing to a standard of legitimate use or a legitimate purpose and fair processing. But my question is who decides what is a legitimate purpose and how can fair processing, how can the concept of fair processing be helpful here to tackle some issues of data processing in a way that really uh, implicates some of the biggest racial justice injustices of our time. And particularly, who decides what is fair or legal, necess ne necessary or proportionate? Um, I think all of this comes together to create a potential depoliticizing effect of data protection rights. Um, unless we understand that many people either legally or de facto cannot, cannot access these rights, I think we're going to be limited to the extent that the framework can really be this universal framework that all of us can use. One case study I want to give to, 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 to give this example is the data protection rights of undocumented people um, all across Europe. So there might be some panels and there's a really interesting panel just following this that goes a little bit into uh, some of the implications of big data, but also mass databases on uh, heavily policed people and, and undocumented migrants specifically. And the work of PECOM really nicely summarizes this. Um, we have seen increased examples of the processing of fingerprinting, iris scanning at the border, and the proliferation of mass scale immigration control databases across Europe. Um, we have also seen, uh, for example, in the EU Migration Pact, that there are going to be proposals to expand these already massive databases 
to uh, facial recognition to inc and to incorporate data, facial recognition data. The eye border control case was just one very famous example of not only how these these uh, systems might be tested and rolled out on 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 people, but specifically how in a situation of extreme unequal power situations, what we're seeing is an extraction of data from potentially very marginalized communities on a very unequal uh, power conditions. Many people who are looking at the history of these things can probably draw some parallels um, between histories of colonial extraction, extraction of our data, particularly considering that many of some of the first experiments for fingerprinting were uh, put forward in colonial India. Now we see them again in context of unequal power situations, but just in other, in other regards. Um, all of these uses are what we as digital rights activists or as a racial justice activists, we might want to use the law to challenge some of these issues. So we might use uh, anti-discrimination law to, to, to many extents, it doesn't work. We might want to use data protection law. Yes? One more minute, if that's okay. Okay, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but there's going to be, there's going to be, we're going to have difficulties doing that. And the partly this is because um, the idea that we should, use the standards of data protection. So legitimate purpose and fair processing is going to limit us in our ability to challenge some of these incredibly harmful uses, mainly because who decides what, what, is, necessi what is necessary and what is proportional, often it is the state or it is these large institutions who say that these interventions are justified. They're justified on the basis of migration management, they're justified it on the basis of security. And in some cases we have seen in the European Commission documents that they're justified because they are for the best safety of the migrants that they are extracting data from. So what I'm what I would really like to put forward is that there's going we're going to, if we look at data protection in a depoliticized way, we're going to have problems with tackling some of the most uh, core issues of racial injustice in our times, particularly because the concepts that lie behind it are based on the notion, number one, that we all experience data protection harms in the same way, and number two, on the basis of the notion that the standard is fair and legitimate purpose and processing, but those who determines those are often those with power and who are most likely to be harmed by those forms of processing are those that do not have any power. And um, I think all of this will lead to my, like, uh, my last question and point, which is that even if we do contest the data processing aspect of, the, of these harms, is that enough? And I think that we can say no, privacy and data protection rights are entirely incomplete as a framework in isolation if they aren't accompanied by at the very simple level, um, how privacy interacts with other rights, but also more broadly, a uh, critique of criminalization, of structural racism, and how of certain, for certain communities, even the universal frameworks and, and rights that we might put forward to them are always not going to be able to access them on the same terms as others, and, and others that are more um, heavily represented in, in our activist circles and communities. Uh, so with that, I'll leave it there. Ah, all right. So I just wanted to say thank you so much, Sarah. Apologies. Uh, and I just, you know, without further ado, I just want to give the word to Nakima because I think you all have very valuable things to say and we'll come to the discussion later. Nakima? Uh, so thank you uh, again, Sita, for the, the invitation and um, CPDP for the opportunity to speak. Um, I will try to be as brief as I can be um, so that we have more time for the discussion at the end. But uh, to just briefly summarize where I'm coming from, I'm coming to this panel considering data privacy in the face of what we've seen um, in North America, in Europe, and elsewhere as creep data surveillance and privacy and digital rights, um, from my perspective, are a particularly urgent issue for everyone who understands and who's seen how social and economic and cultural and racial biases are distorting and restricting um, the freedoms of the people who fall victim to those biases. 
Um, I think that it's important to note that many of the digital tools and environments, especially since the pandemic, that we've become so familiar with, um, encourage the idea that all tech is equal to advancement and improvement and optimization. And there's very little conversation about what tech also encourages, which is oftentimes vulnerability and dependence upon the people who are making the technology and dependence on those who are deciding how the technology is to be deployed. Um, we know that social assumptions drive most discriminatory behavior and also policing. Societal assumptions also drive the way that tech is developed and how it's tested and how it's deployed and on whom. I think from the facial recognition and the drone technology and the homes uh, surveillance technology and contact tracing technology um, that the people who historically are most likely to be targeted by these new technologies and surveilled by these new technologies are also the people who are least likely to understand and to feel empowered to defend their privacy and their human rights. Um, so as someone coming from the black community, uh, one that's historically suffered from mass generalizations, mass uh, collective punishment, surveillance, over-policing, and speaking as someone who today is working very frequently with refugee status people um, who often find themselves in positions where they feel they have no meaningful control over their data, whether it be general data or biometric data, um, I think we need to ask hard questions about the racial impact of technology as it's designed, meaning, for example, facial recognition technologies that fail to accurately match or to function as they're designed um, for people of color, for black and brown people, for women of color, et cetera, for non-binary people. Um, and I think we also need to ask about the racial impact of technology when it malfunctions. So when, uh, for example, the trustworthiness assessment tool that's currently being marketed by some private enterprise um, disproportionately is rating black and brown people as untrustworthy at borders, um, at refugee camps, um, in places where, once again, uh, the power to exert agency over one's data and uh, to assert one's human, human rights, in fact, are limited. Um, in the instances that I gave as examples, those are not necessarily, um, we don't necessarily have the intended function being the victimization of any particular group or person. But um, what happens when that's the outcome? And I think that the response, just as um, Sarah was alluding to earlier, the response has to be more than trying to develop um, better users of technology. Um, because in terms of defending privacy, in terms of protecting against surveillance, we need to be thinking about how to develop better technology uses for those users and we need to incorporate some type of racial advocacy into data protection work, given that uh, the data has shown us that race figures so heavily into how tech impacts both our privacy and our human rights. Uh, thank you so much, Nakima. I'm going to ask a question to both of you uh, before I go to the next two speakers. Um, and I want you to maybe distinguish a little bit between the role of the public institutions and private parties in the kind of surveillance um, and maybe discriminatory systems that you're talking about. Um, I feel like in comparison to the US, but I might be making a very big generalization here, that the institutions, especially in um, mainland Europe, I'd, maybe you can say also something about the UK, are already very, very racialized, right? Like we have migration databases, we have, you know, a lot of the social welfare system will actually capture people who are of lower income. Turns out most of them are people with immigration backgrounds. So in a sense, a lot of the public institutions have already, um, so to say, racialized profiles towards which, um, with which they work. Um, or, yeah, I don't really have a good sociological analysis of how those institutions came to be, um, but I feel like there's something going on with the way these institutions are already set up and running. And then there's the role of the private parties coming in and maybe taking over more and more services from these public institutions. And maybe there are also other elements that I'm not thinking of. And I wonder if you could speak about 
the role and maybe also the way in which these two these different parties work together to cause some of the concerns that you're raising with respect to racialization of, of populations and causing racial injustices. I just to, to quickly uh, reference a case that I'm trying to think what the name of the program is exactly, but um, the French case that I'm thinking of is the National Identification Database that was meant to launch last summer, I believe, um, and had an Android phone application rollout uh, that was announced in November of the year in question. Um, these are exactly these are exactly the kind of intersections where I think the problem is that you have um, unwittingly or inadvertent collection of plenty of invasive types of data about various communities, among them diverse and immigrant and um, incredibly uh, broad groups of people. And you have a private sector that's unregulated entirely when it comes to how the technology that they're selling is being used and on whom. So it's, it's a compounding situation in which there's not necessarily any intent to harm specific communities, but the communities that are exposed to this commercialized um, technology and optimization of national and local um, bureaucratic databases tend to be um, speeding the, the harm, the, the rush to harm uh, communities that are not at any point able to advocate for themselves or even represented in ways that are meaningful about who is mostly being subjected to um, unfair data collection, surveillance type um, representation within the data that's used for commercial purposes. I, I can't add much to Nakima's point, but I would just add in the in the slightly different context of the EU institutions, there's another level to that in in the the vast availability of funding um, that that is created by sort of a hype around AI and other technology technological tools um, in specific areas of like law enforcement cooperation, security or migration control areas where you'll see the in the policy papers um, sort of a vast or quite unquestioned assumptions about how these will help um, such technologies will help in certain uh, circumstances like migration control. So th from, the, from the same entity that is producing knowledge suggesting without much evidence that these things will help without again much explicit understanding of racial justice issues definitely but also even much analysis of the fundamental rights impacts. But the same entity but in another in another area um, like the funding research and innovation areas but also in the areas uh, concerned with industrial policy, you'll then see a big creation of impetus for funding around uh, the need to develop and test those technologies. So I border control was the really obvious case that was very famous. You had at the one hand in various different EU policy documents, the assumption that this would help um, in, the, in uh, make more efficient decisions um, in migration control. But then also on the other hand, you'd have funding for for that same thing. So it was like the supply and demand in, within the same entity. All of this completely divorced from the, the parts of the European Union that are designed to protect equality and justice and also divorced from the, the migration policy entities too. So there's a conversation about the interaction between state and, and national governments in many of these areas, but then you also have the conversation about um, supranational um, entities like the EU, the massive not only funding power that they have to 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 get some of these things in through testing and onto the market, but also the sort of ideological power that they have to present these these techno solutions as um, unquestionably something that we should be adopting and that's going to be beneficial for European society. Wonderful, thank you. I would love to spend a whole afternoon talking about like the role of EU and its decision making and how it actually kind of impacts the ability of nicely more nationally located movements to uh, bring about change uh, when the EU is kind of making these overarching decisions. Um, one of which is the GDPR, the regulation, right? Um, but uh, without further ado, I want to turn to Yasmin Budiev, um, who will maybe 
let us also think a little bit about the technological issues um, among others. Yasmin, do you want to take it away? Sure, thank you so much, Sida, and uh, hello, everybody else. Um, so I, so when, when I think about privacy and data rights, it means being in control of your personal data. Um, and I wanted to speak to a couple of aspects of that data pro process. Um, one aspect is the process of extraction and thinking about what that means as it relates to race. I, I want to make the link between data harvesting by Western entities that are involved in the global south um, and link that to traditional colonial extraction um, of minerals, for example. Um, and I propose that there are similarities that result in harm, in uh, wealth extraction, destabilization and um, even the methods that are employed they mirror classic like colonialist tactics such as soft power so for example um, a western medical company would offer a medical app and seemingly it's an act of altruism of like tech solutionism uh, and they'd offer that to a country in sub-saharan africa with inadequate data protection laws and then they would aggregate that data and then sell it on um, and they make money out of it but the people concerned never really benefit at all um, they definitely don't benefit economically um, there's no informed consent there either and it's invariably black and brown bodies that that are used and involved so it's like a violent uh, element there that is that is being replayed um, in our kind of modern data practice um, and that same company will continue to trade uh, that data even with within countries that use GDPR so I think we'll we'll come to talk about like how privacy policies like GDPR need to be um, uh, modified and more equitable. Uh, I guess we'll talk about that later. I also wanted to mention the um, underlying me mechanics of data practice and how that leads to discrimination. So um, machines that perform complex tasks such as face detection and mass surveillance. They are inaccessible to minority groups. So they're in institutions and private companies. There's both a cultural and financial barrier to them. They cost a lot to build and they cost a lot to run. Minority groups have no power when it comes to how AI is used and therefore can never benefit. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, we see that in surveillance and algorithmic decision making. Um, in that case, privacy interventions, privacy policies, are bound to be ineffective if the material aspects of data practice remain as they are. You can craft the most elegant data protection policies, but they'll be ineffective as long as the underlying material mechanics are not critiqued and dismantled. Um, speaking of things to be dismantled, I think what is needed is quite a radical approach. And I think we need to confront and dismantle government, full stop, and education systems because they're, they're built on colonialist and racist ideals. And only then will there be space for ethical data practice to occur. And that's probably a longer term ambition. But in the short term, we need to scrutinise and make transparent the relationships between government and educational institutions and commercial entities. Again, Sarah's like totally right about this tech solutionism and how this will help and the supply and demand and comes from the same entities, which is completely ridiculous. Um, 
We need to show how the influence of money and power drives research directions and results in unethical and racist data products. Uh, like the work that we do at No Tech for Tyrants uh, critically maps the relationships between uh, research institutions and private entities. Um, and finally, I'd like to see people from minority groups participate at every stage of data practice, uh, especially AI, so that the products benefit their communities. That's some of the work that I do at the Ada Lovelace Institute. And I think that creative tech in particular is a really great way to, to start to explore that. Um, and I think that's it for me for now. Lovely, thank you so much, Yasmin. Um, I think without much further ado, Nani, do you wanna take it away? And I'll come back to the <laughs> two of you together for some questions. Sure, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for having me. Um, so it was really great to, to listen to some of the really good examples uh, that were discussed earlier about um, how the use of digital technologies uh, not only helps to reproduce, but also amplify uh, existing forms of oppression. And that includes, of course, racism, but uh, we should also think about issues such as sexism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, etc. Because after all, we have to look at uh, these forms of oppression uh, from an intersectional perspective. Um, I would like to touch upon uh, two things to, to build upon what was said before and, and, and reflect a little bit about the role of civil society uh, and what they play in all of this, uh, but also the role of government. Um, to start with civil society, um, and Sarah touched upon this a little bit uh, already in what she said. Um, the conversations that we're having in Europe at the moment uh, about uh, data and digital rights uh, more broadly uh, do not really reflect uh, a sufficient grappling with the systemic aspect of racism. And for a good part, uh, that's the result of who is participating in these conversations. Um, Policy debates and the like, uh, if you look around any average uh, virtual at the moment uh, room, when we discuss data protection or anything else, you'll notice that many groups uh, such as disabled people, people of color, people who do not meet uh, normative conceptions of sexuality and gender are usually not present. And this shapes the way in which we conceive issues such as data, privacy uh, and other digital rights issues. And it also means um, a very specific conception of privacy and data protection uh, being prioritized. And this in turn determines what priorities, policy and regulatory objectives are set and shapes the frameworks uh, that are being developed. Um, so the GDPR was mentioned a couple of times and, and, and one can ask the question, for example, if a framework like the GDPR would suffice as one that can address intersectional harms when it comes to data protection. Um, and this is something that we really need to grapple with, um, the way in which uneven power dynamics, uh, exclusion and also privilege play out uh, in, in our field. And that means facing some hard facts, um, including that the current composition of the digital rights field results in blind spots in our work. And it doesn't really ensure that the digital rights of marginalized groups are being upheld. Um, and um, at the Digital Freedom Fund, uh, together with uh, EDRI, uh, European Digital Rights. Um, we initiated work last year on a decolonizing process for the digital rights field. Um, and uh, Jasmine spoke to the issue of, of, of coloniality being uh, perpetuated at the moment in, in data extraction, for example. Um, so by using the term decolonizing, we also mean to acknowledge that the forms of oppression that we're currently seeing have their roots uh, in a history of, of, of domination and also colonization but also that they're being maintained by, by structural forces. And our goal here is to uh, initiate a process that challenges the structural causes of oppression so that we can work towards a digital rights field uh, in which all groups in society have their say and that actually works to protect the digital rights of all. Um, this is an ongoing process. Uh, we only just got started um, and for whoever is uh, present in the room, we cannot see right now, uh, you can find some more information on the DFF website and also on the EDRI, EDRI website, and including how you want to, uh, if you want to get involved. Um, and the second point that I wanted to make was about government. Um, and I want to frame that around an example. 
um, which is the recent uh, child benefits scandal in the Netherlands. For context, I'm Dutch, so I'm picking on my own government here, just to be clear. Um, so most of you may have read about the recent resignation of the Dutch government over a scandal uh, in which as many as 26,000 uh, parents were wrongly accused by the Dutch tax authorities of having fraudulently claimed a child allowance. So in the Netherlands, if you're a working parent, you're eligible for a state contribution to cover daycare costs. If you have a low income, uh, the support that you receive can add up to about 90% of the actual cost that you make uh, in order to make sure that your child is caring, taken care of while you are at work. Some 10,000 families uh, were forced to repay tens of thousands of euros, um, sometimes because really minor mistakes have been made. Uh, someone hadn't signed a piece of paper or missed a small payment, and then they would have then they would be labeled as fraudulent, um, which means that you have no respite. You have to immediately pay back any amount that you might have uh, received in error due to the fraud that you committed. So if you are relying on uh, social support in order to be able to put your child in daycare, having to suddenly pay back tens of thousands of euros can have quite an impact. So this led to uh, unemployment, uh, bankruptcies, uh, divorces, people losing their houses, and one parent even committed suicide um, after they were ordered to repay tens of thousands of euros. Um, the large majority of people affected were of bicultural origin. Uh, so investigations were initiated based on criteria such as double nationality or even a quote unquote foreign sounding last name. And the fact that information about nationality was available to the tax authority in the first place was a data protection violation. In 2014, uh, the law changed in the Netherlands. Um, so the way that citizens were centrally registered um, no longer required for any additional nationality to a Dutch nationality to be kept on record. And the tax authorities at that time should have removed all those data from their systems. They explicitly lied about this. Um, they went on record in 2017 saying that they did not retain information on double nationality, uh, that they did not use it to prioritize individuals for investigation. Um, then the now outgoing prime minister uh, left. <laughs> he said, uh, and I quote, that mistakes were made at every level of the state, with the result that terrible injustice was done to thousands of parents, um, which I would consider to be the euphemism uh, of the year so far. Um, the Dutch Data Protection Authority uh, last year concluded that people were singled out for special scrutiny because of their ethnic origin or dual nationality and that um, those uh, data points were also used in the uh, tax authorities' assessment uh, of requests for support. And the chair of the DPA in the Netherlands said that the whole system was organized in a discriminatory manner and also used as such. So you can trust that with uh, an outgoing PM saying that there's mistakes, uh, which completely fails to acknowledge the systemic racism that's the foundation of this. And I would say also many other issues uh, in the Netherlands. So why am I going on about all this? <laughs> the government may have resigned, right? Uh, they apologized and they promised that there would be some general compensation. But so far they have basically avoided any responsibility for the systemic racism aspect of this data protection violation. Systemic racism was not part of the parliamentary investigation that led to the, to the government stepping down. And I've seen no initiatives so far that actually are focused on preventing this from happening again, either with the tax authority or in other contexts. Um, so I just wanted to flag this because I think that this is actually less extreme than it may sound and, and, and frankly only the tip of the iceberg and uh, kind of indicates like <laughs> in a way also how tremendous the work is that, that needs to be done. Thank you so much, Nani, for that um, very, very um, fascinating omission that happened in the last weeks. Um, both of your talks, um, in a sense, are talking to things that are also systemic almost globally, right? Um, and maybe wide. Uh, I don't know if you followed me, but in Germany, the government gave um, uh, promised to give money to. Um, I think entrepreneurs and families, and it was done in a very quick manner. The data, the the platform that was set up, I, I believe, was also not very professionally done. Um, families had about ten or fifteen minutes to fill um, out their forms. They had to wait in a queue. Had this like 
a small window to fill in the form to get the money, where they had to also be aware of fine print. And so a lot of the money was asked back. And when people didn't uh, understand that this money was to be given back, it wasn't like a one-way aid, but it was something that would have to be returned, um, they started failing and all of a sudden the same kind of criminalization that you saw in the Netherlands started happening in Germany with COVID-19 help. And what happened is that certain uh, mosques were considered as frauding and they were stormed by hundreds of police. Um, so, I mean, th this was really, um, what I'm trying to say is that there's something going on with uh, welfare state giving money and then profiling specifically the most vulnerable and then criminalizing them through exactly the kind of rights they have and the data and algorithms and automation playing a role in that. Um, and coming back to Yasmin, I think some of the stories um, that you uh, talked about reminded me of the rush of Facebook as it was, uh, you know, slowly approaching its IPO to expand to as many countries as possible, which then started having all these political problems for which they had no tools for moderation or anything for that matter. Um, and, you know, and some colleagues, uh, Mark Poon and Khadija Abdurrahman was talking about how Ethiopia, you can talk about a failed state as a result of this kind of irresponsible expansion of user growth into countries where you do not have um, the necessary mechanisms and tools to protect the people and, and, and to provide them with safety. Um, so, but I want to ask a question to both of you because there's a little bit of tension in what you say. You both brought up decoloniality um, and, and you know, Yasmin, where you went for it on the one hand was to say, you know, we need to abolish literally like the whole education system in the state. Maybe I over, maybe I, I'm overemphasizing something here. No, that I, okay. All right. Uh, but at the same time, you were talking about potentially getting rights, right? And, and so I'm just wondering, how, you know, where do these, where do we see the, the, the relationship between decoloniality and law and rights, um, especially because brown and black people have been either um, left out of being able to access their rights, I think that's something that's common across the whole panel, or the rights have been used to um, dominate them in structurally, right? Like, so I want to ask about this relationship to rights and Nani, you were talking about, you know, if we could maybe prioritize um, things differently, if we had different people in the room, if we had different representations in the rooms where we think about law and regulation and policy, then we could make a difference. But I'm just wondering, are you suggesting that the laws we have right now are sufficient, we're just not using them right? Or do we also, from a decolonial perspective, think about reframing some of the legal frameworks or how do we deal with a colonial past of the law? I mean, these are really big questions, but you know, if you want to just nibble at them in some one way or another, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I could um, just mention that, you know, when I say that our government and educational systems need to be dismantled, um, I'm not at all being hyperbolic or unrealistic. Um, and I don't think that it's something that anybody really, I think it's important to capture people's imagination in order for people to start to imagine an alternative um, and I think it's important to aspire to um, a system of living that truly benefits everyone um, and part of that realistically is to start dismantling structures um, but then, you know, I, I do say that that's a long term vision and in the short term is what you alluded to as kind of rights. Uh, part of those rights are thinking about ways of taking up space in conversations um, that talk about policy. And that's something that Nanny mentioned, um, kind of being at the table as these things are crafted. Um, I would also add participating in the early steps of the process of AI. So in the data harvesting, the data collecting and designing the algorithms in building the mechanics and the machines. Um, so the, those are all things that people can participate that will result in better rights. Uh, and then the, the end point being that rights will follow. So I think, you know, action now um, 
results in better rights and always aspire to uh, a better world where these systems don't exist anymore. Thank you for opening our vision for the long term. Um, Nani, do you want to also take a, take a step? Yeah, I'll just very briefly kind of like build on that um, uh, to say like, first of all, I completely believe in, in the idea of kind of having a vision and having imagination about where you where you want to go. And in fact, last week, last, last week, last year, when we uh, had our first gathering uh, in the context of the decolonizing process, that's what we started, right? Like what could the digital rights field look like in 2040? What is, how do we imagine um, that to be? Um, I love your question, Sarah, because it's, uh, one that kind of relates to the older Lord quote that kind of like has, has given me many, many uh, deep hours of thought um, about uh, not being able to dismantle uh, the master's house with the master's tool. Um, but coming back to then though, like having been brainwashed as a strategic litigator, uh, I do come back to kind of like wanting to use the tools that we have creatively in order to bring about structural change. Um, so that's, I think in a way, Jasmine and I are kind of like on the, on the same similar page there, uh, in the sense that you have to kind of like start within the framework that you have to also kind of like lay bare some of the shortcomings that are currently there. Um, there are ways in which we can also show by using the frameworks that are there now, how they do not safeguard uh, the rights of all and what would, could be required in order to have that change. And this is where, and I will not talk about this uh, for too long, but where the beauty of strategic litigation also comes into play in the sense that it's a legal strategy that's married to other initiatives, right? Advocacy, policy work, et cetera, and, and, and all sorts of other initiatives to bring about change. And Nani, before, you, before I give the word to Sita, I know you're gonna ask something, but. I mean, do, do you think that there's some possibility for some interesting litigation with the benefits case in the Netherlands? I'm really curious oh, yes. about your opinion, right? Oh, yeah. I, I can't wait for, for that to actually begin. I see so many options, <laughs> but uh, um, again, like this has to be, this really has to be led by the groups that are, are most affected uh, uh, by, by the benefit scandal. Um, but I would, I would, yeah, my hands are itching. <laughs> Fantastic. Sita, go. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on this thread and also include Nakima and Sarah um, and think about um, just the extent to which some of the big companies uh, in this space are maybe better poised to serve uh, the goals of racial justice than um, say digital rights advocates or other advocates, uh, privacy and data protection advocates, I'm just in part curious and prompted by, uh, I think Yasmin's example of encouraging participation. Um, and, and, you know, in to some extent uh, that is, that, that would fall, uh, that would be very positive um, that that's very uh, would be well received w at Facebook or at um, other companies where there's already uh, a real effort to, to think about how do we um, not appear as surveillance capitalists, but um, people that are just trying to improve the world and make people happy. So I, I, I'm just curious, yeah, where where each of you stands on that. Um, and where in reality this, this, this mechanism for change is actually happening and where it should be happening. I'm very skeptical um, from my perspective. I'm very skeptical as to the extent to which the tech giants, whatever their stated objectives are and their um, interest in being a positive force um, are willing to what we're talking about is dismantling systemic injustice um, and the, the systems and the forces that conspire to disadvantage certain people and communities in the use of and in the um, victimization by certain technologies. I don't know that surveillance capital actors um, are in a, or corporate actors are in a better position to dismantle systemic injustice when 
it comes to any kind of uh, conflict with their profit motives. I, I mean, if it comes to a choice between fixing injustices, uh, systematically studying and working to highlight those injustices versus making money, we know who wins and we know how they will uh, behave. We can give many examples, recent examples of um, activists and advocates who have tried to make even small, you know, adjustments and modifications and recommendations as to how uh, these companies' policies uh, impact the larger world and different communities in that world. And in no case, almost no case, are they um, supported, uh, let alone are their recommendations adopted, quite the opposite. Sarah, do you want to take a stab at it too? Yeah. I 100% agree. Um, our surveillance capitalisms capitalists better at including the issues of racial justice. I think what is a good, what I, I, I make as a good distinction often, and I sometimes like, I talk a lot to Nani about this, is that I think that they might be better at speaking the language of racial justice. And that is also because of resources and the ability to hire the right people, have marketing teams, and also maybe even incorporate some of this language and principle into their design through hiring um, computer scientists and other fairness researchers that might um, be able to, at least on the surface, incorporate some of the language of racial justice at the very least. Um, but when it comes to actual, the, actually the substance, the, the, as Nakima said, the prophet is king. And, and this is something I'm learning very much from, uh, from Seda's work is that um, in so far as this is the governing principle and also considering how far you'll see such massive companies move into this the public sphere um, we should be very careful about this particularly because of its implications for governance and what this means for the public sphere and its very operation um, I will say that this doesn't mean that digital rights or the, or the state is off the hook because did the digital rights field definitely needs to be better um, and it also needs to be better at taking, uh, connecting with other movements, which I think it came to the core of why we all came here today is that even though right now the, the movement is not speaking the right language potentially, and it might not even be taking the right turns, it should be, and it has the responsibility to, if it really is defending the digital rights of all people, but that requires a lot more work. Any other takers on that? I could perhaps just speak a yeah. little bit to Sita's point. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not gonna like mention ethics just for one second and speak to like pre pre existing um, kind of, you know, companies such as you know, Facebook or whatever. Um, like they they their, their products and processes are already like so boring like why participate at such a late stage in the process when you could start with your own process um so i think that yeah participating uh at much much earlier stages uh such as you know in the defining what data even is before you start to collect it, before you start to aggregate it and everything else, rather than later down the process when a company is already using a data product, will produce much more like interesting and exciting, less boring, less violent uh, uses of data and AI. So like part of my response to Sita's question is just like, why would you participate in something that is just so inherently like dull and has been done before and it's so dry, aside from the ethics of it? 
All right, thank you for that. And um, I managed to lose about three of the audience questions while I was trying to figure out a way to get them out of the system, but I did not destroy one. So I'm gonna read that question very quickly. Um, so it's from Jeff Auslos. Um, thank you for the question, Jeff. The, the com It's a comment question. GDPR certainly is no silver bullet. It's more of a horizontal framework that should go hand in hand with other more specific sets of norms or rules, including, for example, non-discrimination. Without claiming the GDPR can solve it all, I think we should be more critical about this narrative that it's only about the individual. This is a narrative that suits big um, tech and is also quite prevalent in civil society. Data protection law does hold potential to challenge more systemic collective issues, such as datafied racism and social injustice. What role is there for civil society, including academia and journalists, to put more emphasis on these dimensions and also step up as facilitators representing minorities, et cetera? Thoughts? If you could put your hand up if you want to take it and then All right, I'll just call your name. Tito. I'll start and I'll try to keep it brief. So in case we can squeeze in one additional question, um, which is to say, um, it partly connects to what Sarah was uh, uh, mentioning earlier about having a bird's eye view. So uh, Sarah said, we need a holistic understanding of how, for example, um, di different interacting forces between research um, about harms of uh, automated computer systems and then research that's um, about innovating and developing such uh, racist datafied systems. Um, we need to have a holistic outlook like a holistic understanding and the capacity to to have that bird's eye view right and to a certain extent that's an analogy for um, what civil society actors in general can play right is to actually provide that bird's eye view to understand how different parts of an interacting system are contradictory um, where the pressure points can be had mm -hmm. uh, and um, when, in fact, it does make sense to advocate for data protection uh, as a priority, say, over other um, issues, other uh, domains of the law. So I, I think it's that bird's eye perspective that's an incredibly uh, helpful. And I don't think we've necessarily seen that uh, in action thus far. Yeah, um, I think you managed to save one of the questions. Um, I think it's the one about companies embedding themselves in public agencies. Do you still have the question in its totality? And I see yes. that. Yes. Can you please read it for us? Thank you. So this is a question from Merv Hickok, uh, which says, what do you think the safeguards should be against private companies embedding themselves in public agencies without liability? Are governments too dependent on private companies now? Great question. Uh, I think Lynette Taylor's recent piece was very much about this, but Nakima, go. I think when it comes to technology, they absolutely are. It's not a secret. Everywhere um, in the EU and certainly many examples in the United States show that um, you have the tech solutionists and you have the um, PowerPoint uh, enabled consultants who come in with solutions that they've rolled out somewhere in the past and whether or not those solutions are uh, fair and are equally um, applied for all sectors of society is never part of the evaluation grid, it seems. So you end up with very, very similar technologies. I'm thinking of Palantir in the United States and now um, in the United Kingdom, and apparently soon to be other parts of Europe because there are so few providers of expertise and solutions when it comes to digitalization, um, certainly in Europe, but but really everywhere. So in terms of embedding themselves in the public sector, this is again, I, I remember the name of the project in France, it's Alicem, the national database. We know that consultants are always the first point of call when it comes to how to optimize and more, most efficiently roll out the digital future um, in the public sector. But in terms of accountability and any kind of oversight, any kind of um, risk assessments uh, in terms of the potential harm, racialized or otherwise, 
no one seems to have very good answers when it comes to that other than different consultants um, and different private <laughs> private sector actors uh, who purport to understand the technology better than anyone in the public sector can. Thank you for that, Nakima. I just really want to take a quick moment. We have to finish, but Yasmin, No Tech for Tyrants is also in a sense about private companies embedding themselves in public institutions called educational institutions. Want to say a sentence before we finish? Yes, uh, we're creating a massive critical map that uh, makes transparent these relationships and their consequences. And uh, yeah, stay posted. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, it was too short. I would love to discuss with you for days. I'm sure Sita feels the same. Um, thanks to all our audience for um, joining us on the chat. I apologize for the questions that I lost. Um, and I really hope that you will find us in the future to pick up on some of the gaps and issues that we have raised, because I do think there is some space for improvement, even on the side of GDPR, despite its limitations. And there's definitely a lot of force to be put together for racial justice. Thank you so much. <laughs>